You are listening to the Through the Bible Studio Series with Pastor Nate Holdridge. Join us as we continue our study through the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Here's Nate. As we turn to Proverbs 22, we have a continuation of the collection of scattered and various Proverbs that Solomon is giving to his son, uh, with a slight twist of some organized Proverbs that will begin at the close of this chapter. Let's start out in verse 1. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. And so here in this proverb, we learn that a good name, or another way of saying that would be an honorable reputation, is greatly desired. So you should want, he's saying, a good reputation, an honorable reputation, he says, more than riches, silver, or gold. Now, this is fascinating because in our society, we strive for a reputation when what we should be striving for, according to Solomon, according to the proverb, is actually a good reputation. You see, we live in an era where people want to be known rather than wanting to have a good name. So we must make sure that within our churches, within our Christian communities, we are working for the fame of Christ, but that we are also working for, as we're aiming towards the fame of Christ, building up a good reputation, one where we are seen and known as faithful, as obedient and diligent. And of course, the target or the aim isn't just to be known as that, because that's a slippery slope into hypocrisy. The hypocrites were the ones in Matthew 6 who wanted to be known for their generosity or known for their prayerfulness or known for their self-discipline through fasting. But what we should want is to actually be that, to actually be generous, to actually be prayerful, to actually have self-discipline. And as we do, then potentially that name will come. But even if it doesn't, what we what we want is the reality more than the uh, false reputation or a negative reputation or being famous for something that is unsavory. Now, in verse 2, the rich and poor meet together together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Now, this is beautiful because it is only in Christ Jesus that various classes and cultures of the world can find common ground. This is what is communicated here in a pre-gospel kind of sense. The Lord, he's announcing, has made everyone. The rich and the poor meet together. And really, the fullest place or position that rich and poor meet together is in Christ Jesus. It said of the early church in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they continued in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. And that word fellowship is the word koinonia. It speaks of a sharing of life together. And what you had there was the beginning of a new humanity, Paul wrote of it more fully in the book of Ephesians, where we are now the body of Christ, comprised of rich and poor meeting together in Jesus. As Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 9 verse 23, the wise man should not boast in his wisdom, the mighty man should not boast in his might, the rich man should not boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this that he understands and knows the Lord. In verse 3 of the proverb, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. So here you have the prudent contrasted with the simple person. Uh, Think of a well-trained soldier heading into battle. They know because of their training Because they are heads up, they know how to step, how to avoid danger, how to hide, how to posture the body. Well, the poorly trained soldier goes right on into suffering. That's the idea of this proverb. The prudent, he sees danger and he hides himself, but the simple person goes on and suffers for it. The the goal, of course, is to become trained, to become astute. I was talking to a youth pastor friend of mine the other day, and he was declaring to me a passion point of his in learning how or telling people to learn how to become askers of questions, to to be discovering and finding wisdom 
from all those who are around them. This is the goal, to become prudent and to know how to navigate life. Verse 4, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Here we have humility and the fear of the Lord, two qualities that God rewards. Uh, He rewards them still, even now in our modern era, though not in the same way that he did for ancient Israel. In the proverb here, it says that the Lord gives them riches and honor and life. But of course, in the New Testament economy, there are times where the richest believers of all are actually physically impoverished. They're spiritually wealthy, spiritually rich. So we're to be a humble people, though, Uh, humble before God, low before God, conscious of our need for God, and then people who fear the Lord, respect the Lord, as the Proverbs have taught us time and time again. Verse 5, thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked. Whoever guards his soul will keep far from them. Now here, what we're learning is that the light should not fellowship with darkness. You know, there's thorns and snares in the way of the crooked. And here the proverb is saying, guard your soul from them. You you must guard your soul for the way of the crooked basically is often attractive. It is appealing to the flesh. And it's so fascinating how even here in the midst of the Old Testament, we have the wisdom of light being sure not to fellowship with darkness, basically protecting yourself from a life of compromise. You know, be careful about what you invite into your life. Be careful about what you invite into your heart, lest it slow you down and trip you up from bringing glory to God. Verse six, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, time and time again, I've referenced as we've gone through the Proverbs, the general nature of the book of Proverbs. In other words, we're going to discover all throughout this book truths that are generally true. In other words, a general truth of humanity is that if you train up a child in the way that he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. It is possible that a child could be trained up very well by their parents, believing parents even, and when they get older, that they would choose to depart from it. But the general rule of thumb, especially as you see it there manifested in ancient Israel, is that with good parents who are teaching their children about the ways and the things of God, that training gets into their heart, and when they are older, they will come back to that beautiful truth if they ever even left it in the first place, which, of course, they don't have to. So the way here that is being uh, spoken of is to the singular way of wisdom, as in the particular path in front of them. And so parents are to hold out that way for their children. And the reason I say it that way is because I think in our modern time, we think that our children have a way of wisdom. In other words, uh, they have their own particular path that we must help them discover. Now, to a degree, of course, that's true. Not every child is going to be a doctor just as not every child is going to be a musician, just as not every child is going to be a scholar. Uh, You know, everyone has the path that is right for them to learn and pursue. But here, what is being spoken of is the singular way of wisdom found in God's word. So parents want to concentrate on training up their children, giving them the word of God, teaching them how to live in response to and in obedience to God's word. The rich, verse 7, rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. Now, an ancient Israelite could become a slave in order to pay off the lender, the person that they owed money to. And It actually, in so many ways, was a grace-filled kind of opportunity. You got yourself into just major debt. You could just get a job with the person that you owed and work it off. Dissimilar to American history, uh, the American history version of slavery, where it was actual ownership of another human being. So here, what we're seeing is the general rule of society 
is that the rich rules over the poor. The borrower is the slave of the lender, and the rich, he says, rules over the poor. This is actually not a proverb really telling you what to do, although you're to look at it and maybe make some applications and you know, use the wisdom in your own life. But this is merely an observation that Solomon is making. The, the observation is that in general, in society, rich people, those who are wealthy in that class, will be in positions of authority over those who are not. So the exhortation here would actually be, on one hand, to the rich or to the lender, and to say, if you're in Christ, do not abuse your position, but use it for his glory to help people climb up to the place that God has called them to. And if you are poor and a borrower, then in Christ, allow the Lord to work with you to get to a place of greater independence. Uh, Because in Christ, you should be able to lean upon him and him alone as you grow in him. Verse 8, whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of his fury will fail. Uh, So in other words, their manipulative techniques will not pay off in the long run. Whoever, verse 9, has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. What does it mean to have a bountiful eye in this proverb? Well, evidence here that you have one is that you share your bread with the poor. Other translations say a generous person or a generous eye. Of course, when Christ came, who came, of course, we remember Hebrews tells us, as the express image of God declaring to us exactly what God is like, it is fascinating that Although he did not spend his entire life and ministry ministering to the poor, a great portion of his earthly ministry was spent in dealing with the uh, actual need of the people in front of him. Uh, Miracles like the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 would come into our mind in thinking about the heart and the attitude of Christ. Drive out, verse 10, a scoffer, and strife will go out. And quarreling and abuse will cease. Sometimes the wisest thing to do is to drive out a scoffer rather than to reason with them and to debate with them. This is so often wise in a church or in a workplace or a family or a friendship. Sometimes you need to sever those ties because it's just not going to go well to try to reason with them because all that's going to increase is quarreling and abuse with that tactic or approach. Verse 11, he who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. Here what we see is that what qualifies a person to be a trusted advisor or friend to the king is that they would have purity of heart which leads to gracious speech. In other words, the grace-filled, pure-hearted person is actually very skilled at being a trusted advisor or friend to the king, to people of prominence. There, There is something really valuable and rare in our modern era about honest and grace filled speech. Now, beautifully, we have a great model of this in Christ himself, because he so often speaks honestly and in a gracious or grace-filled way towards you and me. The eyes of the Lord, verse 12, keep watch over knowledge, but he overthrows the words of the traitor. Uh, God here is seen as being invisibly involved in the words of knowledge, but also traitorous words. In other words, he is watching the words of the traitor and overthrowing them. He, he keeps watch over and preserves the words of knowledge, but the words of a traitor, he overthrows them. In other words, there is protection that comes from God-embedded wisdom. The sluggard says, verse 13, there is a lion outside. I shall be killed in the streets. Now, this is one of those ridiculous and humorous proverbs Uh, Because more than likely, there was no lazy man who was actually coming up with an excuse like this. But the idea is that this is another excuse from the, the sluggard. It's an absurd excuse. 
in one sense, you want to shake this lazy man and say, hey, put that imagination to better use. <laughs> you're imagining a lion that you're going to be killed in the streets if you get up to go to work. Give me a break. Use that mind, that imagination for something else. You see, what God is looking for is God is looking not for this kind of fear and excuse making, but he's looking for faith. He's looking for people that will step out and say, even if there were a lion outside, God is faithful to me. He will build me up and I'm going to go out and get it. I'm going to work hard. You see, the Lord can produce this inside of you and me. The mouth, verse 14, of forbidden women is a deep pit. He with whom the Lord is angry will fall into it. Now, this is a fascinating proverb because what we learn is that the mouth of the forbidden woman is both the sin, but also the punishment. You know, the sin is engaging with this forbidden woman, but the punishment is that you're going to actually get her, is what he's saying to his son. In other words, the dire consequences of adultery are part of God's punishment in his wrath on that particular sin. A great example of this in the Bible would be of Samson. I mean, there he was. He was attracted and drawn to Delilah. And by the end of the story, you just look at what she did to him and you say to yourself, Samson, the thing that you wanted was sinful and you got what you wanted, which was the consequence. Delilah herself was the consequence. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 26 says, I find something more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. And so again, like in other Proverbs, it's a, you know, spoken to a male warning him of a female, but if this had been a, a father speaking to his daughter, he would be warning her of a male. Folly, verse 15, is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Now, this is fascinating because contrary to popular belief, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. They are born into sin just like all other human beings. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3 tells us that we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So the need of a child, according to the proverb, is for discipline because it helps train them. This same concept is repeated in the New Testament in Ephesians 6, verse 4, and places like it, where we hear things like, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Whoever, verse 16, oppresses the poor to increase his own wealth or gives to the rich will only come to poverty. Again, this was a general truth. You know, those who were oppressing the poor to increase their wealth, they would be brought to poverty. It's a general truth and also a truth that was found specifically there in Israel because God was dealing very directly with the nation. We can look out at our modern world and realize that there are plenty who oppress the poor to increase their own wealth, and they've yet to come to poverty. But the day is coming where all accounts will be settled. God will be that full and righteous and complete and at the end of the age, judge. Incline your ear, verse 17, and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, if all of them are ready on your lips, that you may trust in the Lord. I have made them known to you today, even to you. Have I not written, verse 20, for you, 30 sayings of counsel and knowledge to make you know what is right and true, that you may give a true answer to those who sent you. Now, I mentioned this or alluded to this earlier, that we were going to come to a place in this chapter of Proverbs where we are going to see a more organized approach to the Proverbs. And what we see here now is an introductory statement in verse 17 to 21 is that now we have 30 sayings in a row, this collection of Proverbs. It's a cluster of Proverbs. It will take us all the way from this verse, verse 22 of uh, chapter 22, all the way through chapter 24, verse 22. And all of these Proverbs are cast in the form of instructions. And 
sometimes the explanation runs past only one verse on into a second or sometimes even third verse. So these sayings are all clustered together. And as we move through, I'll point out which saying we are currently studying. So saying number one is found in verse 22 and 23. Do not rob the poor because he is poor or crush the afflicted at the gate for the Lord will plead their cause and rob of life those who rob them. Uh, This here as the first saying is a strong warning against taking advantage of the poor and the motivation for making sure that you're respectful of the poor, is that he says there, God will plead their cause. You see, God is over and over again postured throughout the the entire Bible, Old and New Testament, as the defender of the defenseless, as the father of the fatherless. You see, the problem is that many have no concept of what poverty forces a person to do. So many times, people who have not ever really experienced true, crushing, systemic poverty, they just don't understand that it is a crushing and robbing kind of experience. And many who have never experienced that will maybe look at the decisions that a person in that poverty has made and seek to judge them for it. But what we must understand is that that poverty, it so so many times removes opportunity from a person's life. It removes the opportunity to choose wisely. It removes alternatives. It removes so often ways of escape. I think, for instance, about a young person who perhaps gets caught up in some kind of gang activity or something like that. And there's no way that we could ever excuse any kind of evil like criminal gang behavior. But if you were to actually walk in that person's shoes for a small period of time, you might discover that there wasn't as much of a choice or a decision as you might have previously thought. So, you know, what he's saying here in this first one is we can't take advantage of those who are are poor. Don't, Don't rob them. Don't crush them. Don't take advantage of them. They are already going through enough here on earth. The Lord will please plead their cause and rob of life those who rob them. In verse 24, we have our second saying, make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Now here, uh, what we are learning is that angry people are often mentioned in Proverbs, but here the focus is on their influence. So often it's you know telling us not to be an angry person or to beware of anger, but here we learn of the influence of the angry person. If you go with them, if you make friendship with them, You'll learn their ways and entangle yourself in a snare. And it shouldn't be hard for us to look out upon our world and see companies, families, schools, churches, where the staff or the leadership or the whole tone of the people involved in those organizations, there's an angry, sharp, harsh kind of tone. And a lot of times it's because at the top, there was a leader who he or she was an angry person. They'd given themselves to anger. They were wrathful individuals. And their attitude just infiltrated everything in that group. Now, saying number three in verse 26 says, Be not one of those who gives pledges, who put up security for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should your bed be taken from you. This is sage advice against financially risky behavior. You know, you just want to make sure that that you aren't committing yourself financially to things that really could come back to bite you. So, you know, we live in a a lawsuit happy kind of world and culture, so it's good to be on guard, to watch out and to make sure that you don't overly commit yourself. I think this might also have something to say to us concerning an overextension 
of what we can afford and the loans that we pull and all of that. So, so he's saying, be careful financially. Now, our fourth saying comes in verse 28. Do not move, he says, the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. Now, this is a very interesting proverb because the ancient landmark was protected in Israelite law. Deuteronomy 19 verse 14 said, You shall not move your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set. Deuteronomy 27 verse 17 said, Cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Now, the thing that's so interesting about this statement here, it's basically saying, hey, you know, keep the borders, don't steal from someone by moving the landmark or the property line, so to speak, in a way that's advantageous to you. You know, just don't do that. Don't touch that. Respect it. Keep it there. Usually, this exhortation is given in the Proverbs for the benefit of the working class. That... Uh, he maintains, Proverbs fifteen twenty five the widow's boundaries. The idea is that, you know, there's the widow. She's more helpless and doesn't have the protection any longer of her husband. And so the Lord is the one watching over her landmark or her boundaries. Again, Proverbs 23, which we'll see in our next session, verse 10 and 11, don't move the ancient landmark. Or enter the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong. He will plead their cause against you. So you have a couple other Proverbs telling us that God is watching over the landmarks or the boundary lines of the widow and the fatherless. So the application here is that God defends the rights of the poor. But beyond that, there's probably another application of just simply saying, look, In life, there are lines that God has drawn for me beyond just the boundary lines of physical property, but my giftedness, my race, my gender, my geography, my nationality. There are lines that God has drawn for me. And although I can grow and progress and move forward in life and try to benefit myself and my family in so doing, I can also be satisfied with the lines that God has drawn. I can be satisfied with the way I look, with who I am, with where I am, with what I am. I can be satisfied with that because I can be satisfied in him. It all belongs. Those boundaries belong to him. Finally, in this chapter, we have the fifth of the 30 sayings. Verse 29. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Uh, This means skillful, uh, a man who is quick and ready and able. Look, many concentrate on building their networks and many concentrate on building their connections. But those who truly prosper are those who focus on building their skill. And as they build that skill, then the networks and the connections will come and the people in them will be greatly appreciative because they're dealing with a person of skill. But this is better than those who rush to build a network, but who have no skill. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He says he'll stand before important people, kings. He will not stand before obscure men. God bless you. And David. Thank you for listening. For additional resources and teachings, or to contact us, please visit us at nateholdridge.com.